So we will start this session um, by paying our obeisances to His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, who is the founder Acharya of uh, ISKCON. So we have been, um, last session, we started with chapter two and we, um, we gave, you know, we covered the first part, right? Um, the first part, which was Arjuna's indecision, yeah? and then accepting Krishna as his guru. Now, we know that, you know, we discussed, we divided this chapter into five sections. And we covered the first, first section last time. And today we'll be covering the second session, section. And I would just like to highlight that this is, you know, um, the, a very important concept, uh, which Krishna starts with. You know, the first concept which Krishna introduced uh, into Bhagavad Gita, which is, it is also called as Jnana or Sankhya Yogi. And um, analysis, it is basically, uh, Gnana about what? Knowledge about uh, the analytical study of, you know, body and soul, you know. Um, so what is the difference? And these are two different entities. And then, you know, we have the rest chapters which we cover in upcoming sessions. Um, so um, last, I think the first uh, chapter, right, we discussed that Arjuna didn't want to fight. Um, and he gave four reasons in the first chapter. And then he gave one reason in the second chapter. Right? Now, can someone, I know it is on the screen, but still can somebody, you know, uh, tell me what were the five reasons why Arjuna didn't want to fight? It's like compassion with the family members. He had a compassion with the family members. Then uh, fearful that if we kill the family members, the, there will be a sin that we will occur. Then there will be no enjoyment. If we kill them, what is the use? We will basically have no enjoyment of life, a win as well in this war. Then family tradition will go away because uh, once you are killing your seniors, there will be no tradition left. So that is there. And finally, it was indecision. That what should I do now? So, um, so yes, so these were the five reasons. And in the last class, we saw how Arjuna surrendered to Krishna, right? And one of the lessons we learned was that, you know, the way Arjuna surrendered, you know, it is very important for us to think on that as well, right? So we, we learned how, you know, it is, our acceptance that there are better people in the world is really that that thing is needed. You know, we should not be proud, right? Arjuna had Krishna as his friend, but still he surrendered with full heart. Right? And how we saw that Krishna starts with his first shloka itself, chastising Arjuna very badly, you know, kind of scolding, being really heavy on Arjuna. And he called him, you know, um, two main uh, things where well, you know one is he called him as anarya right uh, a person who doesn't realize you know the, the, the importance of this life who is not aware of scripture anarya and he also calls arjuna as impotent yeah so now when arjuna surrenders only then krishna starts his advice or instructions now what do we learn right from here, what is the lesson from for us that we, you know, we should learn not to give unnecessary advice or instruction, you know, unless we see the opposite person really, you know, seeking for that from us. Right? Otherwise, we must have, we all must have faced in life that, you know, if we give, if we try to step up and give advice to somebody, 
without them seeking, it is then our advice is not taken seriously, right? And rather, you know, it's taken negatively because they think, oh, they don't value it. So it's a good lesson that unless a person is seeking from us, you know, any advice or instruction, we should not be giving it. Otherwise, you know, there's no value. For it. So after Arjuna surrenders, Krishna starts instructing Arjuna, right? He said in the last session we saw that, you know, he chastised Arjuna not to lament unnecessarily. Yeah. Um, so from this section, Krishna is introducing the concept of body and soul. And this is the first concept Krishna is introducing. And it is, you know, from this section, we will eventually, we need to understand that we need to remove our mindset uh, that, you know, we are this body. Yeah. And we need to keep reminding ourselves that we are this soul. And if we are, you know, lamenting, like Arjuna is lamenting the superficial aspect, which is the body, right? It is not worth it. We should be worrying more about the soul. Yeah. So we'll get started. Um, so who are we? Yeah. So we see, um, we, we always address, you know, right? Um, our parts of our body that this is my hand. This is my face. You know, uh, this is my, you know, different parts of the body, right? This is mine. Now, when we say mine, what is that mine? And Krishna is going to describe that. That mine is not the body, it's the soul. Yeah. So primarily, uh, we all know and we have studied that our body is made up of maximum percentage of water, from water, right? around 70% of our body is made up of it. And we see here how different organs have different, um, you know, um, proportion of water, right? And different uh, components like, you know, like these, you know, above, now, uh, yeah. And when each of our organ have different percentage of water, at the same time, our scientists have, you know, uh, mentioned that, Overall, the body is made up of water and these elements, these components, which is like calcium, iron, phosphorus. There is a specific percentage of each of these, right? And when we account for these all components, the material components our body has, when we calculate, we come up that the total worth of this human body is what? With, with these components. It's just 350 rupees. Yeah. So... And the amount we value our body for everything, the amount we take care of our body, you know, we really keep it at the topmost priority, right, in our life. We are, you know, the, the main thing what we think all the time is to, you know, uh, that we should be happy. When we say the, the material comforts and everything, what we aim for, eventually, what is it worth it for? 350 rupees, right? So, we can think that, you know, this in a better way with an example of if we say, if we see an accident, yeah, if a, if a car meets an accident, the car is 10, at least 10 lakh rupees worth, right? And what is the body which is within the car? It is just 350 rupees worth. That's what we have calculated, right? It's not we, it's the renowned scientist, right? So will we take care of this 350 rupees from our material mindset? A, a thing which is a 350 rupees worth or the thing which is, you know, 10 lakh worth. Yeah. So that really makes, should make us deep dive and understand that there is something definitely more valuable than these bunch of chemicals which makes up our body. Right? And what is that? Right? So we'll come there. So um, we see these two pictures, right? Um, I want you know everybody to participate. If, you know, and can you, can any one of you tell me what is the difference between these two pictures? One one picture, first picture is basically the living bodies, and uh, second picture is a dead body, right? Right. 
Thank you, Biswaji. So, in the top picture, we see that you know people are traveling in train. And if we have ever traveled, we know how it is annoying that people push each other and they go and really get annoyed. Right? And uh, you know, same when you push this body, which is dead, it will it get annoyed? Will it move? No, right? The same body is there, but what is missing? The consciousness, right? So that's why, you know, when we, when we pinch ourselves, you know, we really feel the pain, right? So we are, that's the consciousness within our body, right? We react. But if we, you know, do the same to this dead body, we know that, you know, the body, it is, there is a lack, you know, the conscious, consciousness is missing, right? So what, what means that, this, like we saw, there is much more to do with the body than just the kingdom chemicals right so between these two living and dead body the chemicals are the same the body is the same right but the difference is that um, the dead body doesn't have feelings and it cannot think it has no desires no movement right and no consciousness now what is now we land up with when we see all these parameters? What is Krishna trying to highlight here is that there is something which is missing. And when we say consciousness is missing, consciousness is what? Consciousness is nothing but the symptom of having soul within the world. Okay. So this is what this section is primarily aiming at to really and have that analytical study of matter and spirit matter which is body and spirit which is the soul so moving further so this is the first shloka for today and uh, it is spoken by krishna um, and uh, as soon as arjuna surrenders you know here we see how krishna takes up immediately the position of being a teacher yeah a spiritual master so would someone want to try the Sanskrit Shloka from your end? Shri Bhagwan Uvachaha Asochyan Annu Anuva Sochaha Tvam Prajana Vadam Scha Bhashaha Gatasun Agastasum Scha Nanu Sochanti Pandataha The Supreme Personality of the God had said while speaking learned words, you are mourning for what is not worthy of grief. Those who are wise lament neither of the living nor the dead. Thank you. So, Krishna clearly says here that, you know, while speaking, you know, learned words, learned words, right? So Krishna is, we saw how he is chastising Arjuna, you know, that he's speaking learned words, like, you know, uh, but at the same time, he's mourning for something like, you know, this matter, which is not worth of grief. Yeah? So we learned in the prior class, the difference between a Brahmana and a Kripana, right? A Brahmana is the one who has the knowledge, yeah? who knows the purpose of this life, real purpose of this life, who has the knowledge of, you know, matter and spirit, you know, the soul, uh, super soul and the material nature. So they are aware, right? They have the knowledge of this. And Arjuna, even after know, knowing this, he is still be behaving like a Kripana, right? So that's what he says, that his miserly weakness is acting on him, right? Now, um, for a person who knows that uh, the, the, what is body, what is soul, they will, that they are called as wise by Krishna. And they, Krishna is saying that there will be no lamentation once you are aware. You know? uh, and neither, you know, um, these wise people don't lament for any stage of the body. You know, re neither when it is living or when it is dead. Because body is temporary. And it's the soul which is permanent. And we'll see this further. Yeah? So, 
um, what Arjuna is also saying in the purport, we see, Prabhupada has mentioned that one of the things uh, highlighted is, you know, the different kind of approaches. So Arjuna is saying that, you know, he, something called as Artha Shastra and Dharma Shastra. Yeah. And Arjuna argued that he is following Dharma Shastra because that is greater than Artha Shastra. Now, what is Artha Shastra? Artha Shastra is, you know, related to politics and sociology, yeah, which Duryodhan party was really doing, right? They, they believed in Artha Shastra and all this, you know, um, in the political front, right? But Arjuna says that, you know, he, he won't, he is following Dharma Shastra, the religious principle. Yeah, killing is not right, and he's following the dharma, and you know, having uh, attacking the superiors and all of that. So, Krishna then highlights to Arjuna, you know, further higher than the Artha Shastra and Dharma Shastra is something called as Jnana Shastra. Yeah? So, Jnana Shastra is even greater. And what is Jnana Shastra? What is that Jnana? The knowledge of matter, soul, and the super soul. Yeah? Well, and Krishna now highlights this as well, you know, uh, as how eternally the soul, we all exist and we have our own individuality, yeah, from this verse. So it is like, Nartham eva ham jatuna sham, Nartham me me jana dipaha, Nartaiva na bhavushyamaha, Sarve vayam ataha param. So this is a very important shloka because like I said, it describes the two aspects of us, our individuality and this individuality stays eternal. Yeah, the eternality is also. So uh, there are few class of men, um, some of you might know who are called as Mayavadis, right? So uh, Mayavadis, their philosophy is that this soul when it is in material world, it is covered by maya, illusion. You know? And at the time of liberation, this individual soul, you know, is separated by maya and it goes and merges into the something called as Brahman, which is, we, we learned about the three absolute aspects of, you know, uh, aspects, right? First is the impersonal, the affiliates, right? Which is Brahman. Then comes the Paramatma, which is the super soul, and then comes the Bhagwan aspect. And Bhagwan aspect is the highest, right? Uh, and the most perfect. So these Mayavadis are, they believe that, you know, after uh, death, this our soul liberates and it goes and merges into this Brahman, which is the impersonal life of Krishna, right? So, uh, and this is clearly declined by Krishna. You can see, yeah? Because he says there was never a time when I did not exist, nor you, nor all these kings, nor in the future shall any of us cease to be. So there is an individuality clearly mentioned here, right? And there is also Krishna is saying that there will never be a time, even in future, when we won't exist, right? Because the thought process of Mayavadis is once, you know, we, uh, it's, it's talking about, you know, like Bhagwan me lean ho jana hai. You know, it's like uh, merging with, with the Brahman, with the impersonal life. It's about merging. And after merging, we lose our illusion. Whereas Krishna clearly declines. Yeah. And this, um, you know, the Krishna is saying, uh, Arjuna, clearly that everyone in the battlefield are eternally individual beings, right? Be it past, present, or even in future. Yeah. And Krishna is the maintainer of the individual beings that in material world as well as in spiritual world. So if this individuality was not really important, then why would Krishna stress it so much? Right? It is important. Right? So, and if, you know, we have, uh, like we learned before, uh, that if there are class of people who say that, you know, who, who refers Krishna's, um, they refer Krishna's individuality, maybe that what he's referring here is 
with regards to the body and not to the soul. Right? When we see just this verse, it can be interpreted that Krishna is talking about that there will never be time that we don't exist. He's referring to the matter, to the body and not to the soul. And that's why it is key that in Bhagavad Gita, we don't just pick up, you know, one verse and you, we, the interpretation might go in different directions. Because just before this word, Krishna, you know, is uh, chastising Arjuna as why he's lamenting for something temporary, right, which is this body. And in next verse, we'll see, you know, which is also one of the most important verses where we see that how Krishna clearly says there are two components, Dehi and Deha. And Dehi is the soul and Deha is the body. And this Dehi, you know, doesn't undergo any change and it is eternal. Whereas Deha is temporary. Okay. So it is really important that we go with, you know, we, we go in the flow of the way Krishna has spoken the shlokas and not just pick one and interpret it. Right. We have to have the flow. So, um, and, and, you know, um, the thing is, we also learned that to understand Bhagavad Gita, what are the qualification prerequisites? One is we need to be a devotee. And, you know, and the second is that we need to have a relationship with Krishna. Right? So that is the one what it's mentioned in fourth chapter. You know, Krishna highlights it to Arjuna that the reason why he's imparting this knowledge to him in specific um, is because he is his devotee and his friend. And it can only be understood by a devotee. And we saw how Prabhupada mentioned that, you know, at least looking, you know, having faith on our scriptures, theoretically, one should at least, you know, have faith that Krishna is the Supreme Person. Yeah. So, so um, yeah, and he says, Prabhupada says in the purport that how, you know, if you're a non-devotee and you are reading Gita, trying to understand, the scriptures, then it's like, you know, licking the, um, you know, a bee licking on a bottle of honey uh, and not on top of the bottle, not in, within the bottle. So it's like they don't get the real taste because they are not looking at the way Krishna wants to say, right? So to enjoy the nectar of Gita, we have to, you know, deep dive into the bottle. If we just lick the out, outside of the bottle, we are not going to test, get the taste of Gita. And we see also in this picture here how this is a picture of Vaikuntha, how we see that each individual is having their individuality and they are, you know, serving Krishna. Right? So, so with that said, we go to the, you know, um, next shloka, which is, I was saying, the, you know, one of the most important shlokas of Gita, where Krishna highlights that these changes of body is natural. Um, would someone wants to try the Sanskrit shloka? Someone who hasn't tried it? Yeah, I'll try. Give it a try. Hare Krishna. Dehino asmin jatha dehe komarang jovonang jara tatha dehantara prapti viras tata satra nao muhyoti. Thank you. That was really good. Thank you. As the embodied soul continuously passes in this body from boyhood, boyhood to youth to old age, the soul similarly passes into another body at death. A sober person is not bewildered by such change. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Thank you, Vishwanji. So, like I said, in, you know, that Krishna is highlighting or emphasizing here on existence of two entities. One is Dehi and the other one is Deha, right? Body and soul. Right? Now, when we think, you know, with the example, when we meet somebody after years, yeah, we see we, we in, in our cousins or, you know, cousins, children, when we meet after years, we are surprised to see the amount they have grown. And, and, you know, and what does that mean that, you know, they, they have, you know, their body has changed, right? But it's the same them. So the soul is the same. They remember the instances, we can talk over it, we can discuss over it, but 
you know, it's so difficult to recognize them because they have grown. Right? So, so something, you know, um, when we see them growing, there's something, right, which makes us think that body has changed, but there's something which is the same. And what is that same? Their soul, right? Our body, uh, in purport, if you read, if Bhagavad has mentioned that there are six transformations, you know, a body undergoes. The first one is birth. Second one is, you know, then the body grows, right? After birth, we grow. And then we maintain at certain, you know, uh, for some time in the same way. And then we reproduce, you know, uh, having children. And then the body dwindles, you know, in the old age, it starts dwindling. And eventually the death arrives. So these are the six transformations every body undergoes, you know, six changes. And our scientifically also, we have, uh, our scientists have established that there is a transformation of all the cells within our body every seven years. Yeah, so it is an established uh, you know, finding. So um, that's why Krishna is highlighting here that you know uh, the soul, embodied soul, passes into this body within this body from boyhood to youth, and then to old age. Yeah. Similarly, at the time of death, what happens? It transmigrates from one body and takes into the other. Yeah. And this shloka highlights, you know, a term in the end, dhiras tatrana muyati, right? Dhiras, dhira, right? Now, who is a dhira? So, any person who has a perfect knowledge of, you know, the constitution of our soul, you know, Krishna being the super soul, and this material nature, yeah? So who has the knowledge of both spiritual entity and the material? He's called as a dhira, yeah? So, so a, such a person, you know, dhira statra such a person will not get disturbed, right? So he will not get lamented, yeah? So, he will never get deluded by, you know, when the change occurs because he knows, you know, this is natural. The change of the body is natural. So now with Arjuna, Krishna is saying there was no cause for lamentation for Arjuna on account of death of Bhishma and Drona. You know, because this is a natural process. And Krishna is trying to highlight Arjuna that, you know, even if he doesn't kill them right now, because this is a natural process of body which has to undergo, they will die one day, you know. There will be no way that Arjuna will be able to save them from death forever, right? Rather, you know, and if they die, you know, right now, if he kills them and they die on the battlefield, then because they are dying, um, you know, um, doing their prescribed duties on such a holy place, they are sure, you know, they are great souls. They are sure to... Uh, have spiritual bodies or they are sure to get higher planets in the next life. Yeah. So there is no need for Arjuna to lament because either way they will die. And either way, even if you know uh, they are killed in this battlefield, it is like you know they are gonna get a better body. And they are, you know, their body is dwindling already with their age. So they will get a better body after this. So that's what Krishna is trying to explain here. Okay, now, and we see, you know, to establish a, a kind of example for uh, this transformation of, uh, sorry, transmigration of soul from one body to another, uh, we all went through this, you know, we know reincarnation, right? Um, and we, we believe in it because we have several examples which we have seen, you know, several times even now in news it comes that, you know, how reincarnation has happened. And we learned this um, story of Deep Kapadia in our nine sessions that how he was uh, he was born in Mumbai. He was actually a Marathi family, but he knew Marwadi just like that. You know, in, naturally he knew. Nobody was around him who could speak Marwadi, but he knew it. And he always used to re re you know, uh, reiterate that, you know, um, that there is some, you know, he wants to, wanted to go to Udaipur. Right? And how his parents, you know, they thought he's mentally disturbed. They, they took him to different doctors. 
And at the end, you know, one of the doctors said, why don't we just try to see what he's saying? Just take him there. And when they took him there, they came to know how he went to his house. You know, his son had obviously grown. So, uh, you know, beyond his age now. So he said that, oh, you are my son, which was a shock. And then there were a couple of things which where he proved that, you know, he remembered it was all coming from his past life. Well, for example, you know, his son asked him, you know, that, um, you know, can you tell me there's a secret place we have the, we keep the rifle at home. And he could go to the second floor of the house immediately, behind, behind the painting, he could find that rifle for that, which was only known, you know, a couple of them within the family. And the same thing, you know, he used to work in his past life in a museum where a particular fan worked, you know, kerosene fan worked in a way, you know, particular way. So he, he kind of operated that and that these, this is what we see, you know, so definitely there is reincarnation because soul transmigrates from one body to another, yeah. And, and we also hear many instances where, or, or we see in, in, you know, internet that there are instances where, you know, people are in the operating room and suddenly, you know, they could feel, right? Uh, they, you know, they say that I was within there and I came out of the body, I could see people working on me, right? So there are instances, and so if overall with this, it is very important for us to, you know, um, relate ourselves, you know, with these examples. Just not learning, you know, what is in Gita, you know, but digesting it, you know, we, only by relating ourselves we will understand you know, that we are not this body, but we are soul. And body is not permanent, right? So unless we have this clarity. Uh, we will not spend our energy on nourishing the needs of our permanent soul, but we'll keep nourishing and focusing only to work on our body. Okay, so, so overall, so far, what we saw was that body is matter, soul is spirit, body is not conscious, there is no consciousness, and soul is, you know, the peace. Consciousness is a symptom of soul. Yeah? And body changes, what we saw, it undergoes those six changes, you know? uh, birth and you know, growth and all of that. And then soul, yeah, we saw with that example of meeting somebody after years, soul remains the same. Right? There is no changes. Body is temporary, soul is eternal. And body, yeah, it's dead because it's matter. And soul is the one which has the life, which is soul. Yeah? Now, when we understand this soul and body knowledge or concept given by Krishna, you know, we will start accepting things. Yeah, it makes us easy or not easy, but at least you know to have an open mind of accepting things. Um, otherwise, we see you know that uh, so many people go under depression, and we saw how you know the most developed country in this world. Uh, uses the most antidepressants, right? So, um, you know, people are under heavy depression and with anxiety as, why am I getting this disease? You know, uh, as simple as, you know, my face are getting wrinkles, I'm getting white hair. So there are so, so many concerns they have because they're so attached to their body. Now, this concept of which Krishna is giving, you know, it should give us a strong understanding that we are not this body. Just we are focusing and nourishing our body so much that we are, you know, which is, you know, even after nourishing it so much, we still undergo these problems in life, right? Because the solutions what we come up with are not are temporary; they are never permanent. So, so Krishna is highlighting that the permanent feature of you know us is the soul, and we should utilize this human life where we have this level of consciousness to nourish the soul and just not the body. Yeah? And in this way, if we nourish the soul, how does the soul get nourished? By you know, chanting, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare. Chanting, reading, hearing about Krishna, you know, all those steps of devotion service, right? So this way we will get closer to Krishna. And some might say that, you know, that does, does that mean that we neglect the body? You know, that is not the case. It's not about neglecting the body. You know, we should still take care of our body, um, you know, to keep it healthy. 
why the mindset should be more krishna centric where we take care of our body keeping in mind that i am able to do my prescribed duties which is also you know doing krishna bhakti right it should be healthy enough so that i can perform my bhakti seamless right devotion service so with that we move to another important shloka like i said today i think we have around you know on the top list of 108 shlokas of bhagavad gita today we are at least covering four or five so it is a you know major section where krishna is highlighting quite a lot of important you know aspects so the next shloka is 2.14 where uh, which is the answer to you know Krish, uh, arjuna's question by krishna that now arjuna understood when you know with the prior shloka that okay soul is permanent and body is temporary but then arjuna might still argue right he might he he, he says that but what do i do i'm still attached to you know this particular body of bhishma and drona you know i don't want to get separated with this particular body because i love them in this world right now what does krishna says in answer you know is this uh, shloka so matra sparshastu kanteya shitoshna sukha dukhadaha agama paino nitya stans tikshashva bharata so uh, hari krishna ji will you like to read the english version okay um harshita will you be able to yeah person of kunti the non permanent appearance of happiness and distress and their disappearance in due course are like appearance and disappearance of winter and summer season they arise from sense perception ocean of bharata and one must learn to tolerate them without being disturbed thank you so what is krishna asking him to do tolerate right? to learn the quality of tolerating so when krishna arjuna is saying that how you know i'm i'm still attached to the this body you know this form of their body so krishna is saying you have to learn to tolerate you know so first quality you know we need to develop which krishna is saying is this right? now krishna is specifically highlighting here calling arjuna as konteya and two names in fact in this shloka bharat right konteya is what so konteya is krishna is reminding arjuna that he is from a very you know great lineage yeah uh, konteya is the son of kunti right and um, bharata is representing his lineage of his father son right the kurus so <laughs> krishna is specially highlighting him to remind him that he is a kshatriya he is from such a you know uh, well known lineage so he has to set the example he has to discharge his duty as a kshatriya right and we have to he has to learn to tolerate right we saw how because he is in a leadership position and we saw how before as well we all are in a leadership position in our own ways right and uh, it is very with the leadership position comes responsibility right and sacrifice Yeah, there were, they, we cannot have any position without a level of sacrifice. We saw how we as mothers, you know, we cook, made the winter or summer. We, we we tolerate the heat while cooking in summer. So can we say that we won't be able to cook in summer? The same thing, you know. With so, it's it's very important to discharge, and we also see how devotees. no matter you know it's winter or summer they still wake up early in the morning they have their bath you know irrespective of that coldness you know winter or summer season right so uh, similarly a kshatriya has to fight you know a uh, dutifully even whether it is in front of him as the enemy friends relatives and it right? and with his great heritage and lineage of arjuna that that comes as his key responsibility right so overall you know um, one of the key things here for us to take away from this shloka is to 
learn to tolerate. Quite a lot of us think that the person who tolerates is the most weak. Yeah? It's taken as a weakness. Yeah? But it is our biggest strength. Yeah? The person who learns to tolerate is really, you know, a person who can, who is, who is, you know, with that caliber, with, it's, their, it's like a Mahan Hasti, you know. So we need to learn this uh, art of tolerating. And how can we, you know, I think it, it, I will, you know, I just recently heard something very nice where it was like, you know, um, we need to uh, learn this art of tolerating by observing ourselves. Sometimes we think that tolerating is, let me suppress my anger, let me suppress my emotions. But when we suppress, we eventually see that we, after some time point, it explodes and it becomes more worse, right? So suppressing is not the solution, but it's rather that um, we need to first learn to look into you know, the situation and get self-aware as, you know, um, notice the situation, bring your emotions at, you know, a more conscious level, you know, um, and first of all, when we say self-aware, um, acknowledge it, right, and once we kind of start acknowledging this, you know, that the situation, we start seeing that we, we, we can digest the situation much better, right, we learn to, you know, act a particular way when we digest that situation, and then we sort it. So uh, this was what I learned that rather than uh, the main thing here is observe ourselves, how we behave in that situation, how we get impacted in that situation. Yeah. Rather than getting absorbed in the situation itself, you know, we get absorbed so much in this situation that we get carried out and, you know, things explode. So rather observe ourselves and then we can come up. Yeah. So. So yeah, and, and we also see if we develop this quality, the best thing, the benefit is that uh, we can see that how less disturbed we are mentally and we can rather perform not only our material duties much better, but also spiritually. Yeah? So both are done a better way when we kind of digest what is happening and digest our weakness our uh, and acknowledge that. Yeah, rather than suppressing. Yeah. So this is one of the key quality which Krishna highlights here, which is tolerating. So further, um, this is Shloka 16 and 17. So uh, Kavya ji, will you be able to read this? Uh, yes. Those four years of truth have concluded that of the non-existence, the material body. There is no endurance and of the eternal, the soul, there is no change. This they have concluded by studying the nature of both. That which pervades the entire body, you should know to be indestructible, avinashi. No one is able to destroy that imperishable soul. Thank you, Vagashi. So... Two things I have highlighted here. One is Tattva Darshinaha. So these are self-realized souls. Yeah? Who, know the, who are self-realized? Who know the truth? And what is the truth? That we are part and parcel of Krishna. You know? We are his energy. Whereas Krishna is the energetic. Yeah. So... <laughs> Hence, because we are his energy, we are his subordinate and he is supreme. Okay. So, um, here this is kind of a beginning of instruction for, from you know, Krishna that um, living entities, we all, we are bewildered through what? Through ignorance. Yeah? Um, and because of that ignorance, we think we are this body, not this soul. Yeah. we need to understand that we are nothing but part and parcel of the Supreme Personality of God, Krishna. And what is our, our role? You know, what is our duty? Um, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says that Jivera Swarupa Hoi Krishnera Nityadas. What does that mean? That we are eternally servants of Krishna. Yeah. 
So that is the nature of the school. That is the beauty of the school. So re-establishing how can this relationship, you know, eternal relationship between the worshipper and the worshipable. Worshipper is us and worshipable is Krishna. How can this be re-established? By, by removal of this ignorance and by understanding the truth. Yeah. So this verse more, you know, it clearly explains the real nature of the soul, right? That it's spread. It mentions about consciousness as well. You know, that 2.17 shlok we see, that pervades the entire body. Yeah. Is, we should know it is indestructible. Avinashi. Right. So that is nothing but consciousness. It is the, it is a symptom, right? That there is a soul present in everyone. That's why it's mentioned here that it pervades the entire world. Yeah? So um, it's it's like um, we all have our individual consciousness, right? If um, if I, you know, I, if I uh, kind of pinch somebody else, the pain what they undergo, I cannot. Undergo. I I don't understand, right? Because it is a individual consciousness of that world. So it's similar to when we when somebody takes medicine, it, it kind of spreads all over the body. Right? The same presence of soul is spread all over the body as consciousness. Right? Okay. And in purport, we also see how amazing is the soul. And we'll see this further as well. That in I think Mundaka Upanishad and Shwetashwara Upanishad, Prabhupada has highlighted this in the purport that from in these two scriptures, it clearly mentioned the size of the soul. Yeah? We know that now the, the kind of where is it within the bodies spread all over as consciousness. Now, what is the size of the soul when it is spread all over the body? They have mentioned that it is one ten thousand of upper portion of the hair. So the tip of the hair, if you divide it into ten thousand, you know, um, just the tip, that is the size of the soul. It's that tiny. Yeah. And with our imperfect senses, yeah. We can't. Right? So, this is also an example which is given in the purport that a tree which uh, which has uh, two birds on it. One is the jiva, which is the soul, and the other one is the super soul. Yeah? And it says, again, it is from Mundaka and Shukashwara Upanishad the jiva soul is struggling very hard on the tree of the material body. Yeah? The tree is represented as Madhya But as soon as he agrees to accept the other bird as the supreme spiritual master, as Arjuna agreed to do for by voluntary surrender unto Krishna for instructions, the subordinate bird immediately becomes free from all calculations. Yeah. Now, uh, we, yeah, it is very uh, nicely mentioned how we are so busy, you know, the jiva here. That bird, uh, which represents the jiva soul, is struggling very hard on the tree. You know, uh, checking all the points, fulfilling the material desires. Right? He he thinks he is the doer. Right? But Krishna is just next to us. If we turn towards Krishna and if we start depending on Krishna, then Krishna can, you know, he will help us. He will definitely immediately take charge, like he took immediately in charge. You know, he took the charge to. Uh, be, to be as a spiritual master for Arjuna, as a teacher. Right? So, similarly, if we, you know, look at Krishna, if we surrender like Arjuna to Krishna, then he will take charge of us and through his representatives, which are which will be our spiritual masters. Yeah? And, and we see this, you know, how our life, how our anxieties, how our desires, you know, eventually calm down because we are dependent on Krishna. We don't have the mindset, the devotees don't have the mindset that we are the only doer, right? So, and that's what Krishna says. Once you start, you know, uh, developing that faith and, you know, like following the devotional practice, chanting, reading, hearing, all the devotional service, he mentions it, uh, highlights in 10th chapter, 11th shloka. He, he says that, you know, he says uh, um, in the shloka that jnana deepena bhaswata. So what does that mean? That he lit the lamp of knowledge you know, within our hearts, within our heart. He's, that ignorance starts destroying and the knowledge starts coming and we become aware. You know? 
about our real position. Like I said, you know, devotion, that devotional service is the only thing which can nourish the soul and soul is the one which is permanent. So we should rather put our, our energy towards the soul, not on the body, right? So this is the 18th. Now we see in this picture, you know, there are two things. Um, yeah, so the first picture shows that the person, you know, is airlifted, he is suffering, you know, very badly. He's critical, right? We see doctors around him. And uh, we saw during COVID situation how there were so many families where we, you know, this critical uh, you know, situation was faced. Right? But in the second picture, we also see that there's a coffin, right? So the person is there. So uh, this shloka says the material body of the indestructible immeasurable and eternal living entity. So these qualities are of soul. So the material body of that soul is sure. No, the material body of the indestructible, immeasurable and eternal entity is sure to come to an end. So the material body is sure to come to an end. Therefore, Krishna is saying quite a right? So as soon as the spirit soul, you know, from the first picture and the second picture again, as soon as the spirit soul is out of the body, look at the value of that body. Does it have any value? You know, first picture, we would spend lakhs together to get this person to the right hospital. We have doctors around to take care of, to make sure that, you know, the person is taken care of. But in the second picture, you know, as soon as the uh, soul leaves the body, the body is then shipped along with our baggages, right, in the flight. So it loses all its importance. It is just because it becomes so unimportant, just like you can see in the picture lying in there. So, um, so the same body once when it is you know to be shipped when it is dead, it does not have any value. But when we spent lakhs together to just have the life living body, right? So, so soul is the one which has the real value. Okay. Now, uh, again, one more important shloka, um, which shows clearly that the soul never dies. Yeah? So, na jayate mriyate va kadachi nayam rupa bhavita va na bhuyaho ajo nitya hashashvato ayam purano na hanyate hanyamane sharire. So, Reshma ji, will you be able to read it? Yes, ma'am. For the soul, there is neither birth nor death at any time. He has not come into being, does not come into being, and will not come into being. He is unborn, eternal, ever existing, and uh, primeval. Mm -hmm. He is not seen when the body is. Thank you. Bhagavad Gita. Thank you. Well, so again, I think I'll just highlight some important aspects here, which is very clearly defined by Krishna. So he says, Nayam Bhutva Bhavita Vana Bhuya. Yeah. So these are three tenses. Bhutva is what? Having come into being. Bhavita is will, yeah, will come to be. And Bhūyaha is again coming to be. So that's, and and the nature of the soul, you know, is mentioned in the third line here. Ajo means, ajaha means what? Unborn. Nityaha is also eternal. Shashvat is also permanent. And Purana means it's the oldest. Yeah, it's primeval. Right? So, these are, this is the conclusion in a way by Krishna that Arjuna's first reason not to fight, which was compassion. You know? um, this is that he, in here, it is a, it is very critical to know that anyways, this body is going to come to an end. Yeah. So Arjuna should not stop to do his prescribed duties. Right. Now, 
again highlighting you know that no one can kill the soul right krishna is saying oh partha how can a person who knows that the soul is indestructible eternal unborn and immutable kill anyone or cause anyone to kill so krishna is again and again trying to you know explain to arjuna that he is not killing anybody as such right because arjuna's compassion is that you know first of all he was he said that you know dharma he wants to find follow the religious principles you know and it is like he he was more um, attached that killing you know he was thinking killing would be really a wrong thing so everything has its proper utility right um, like we use we use different things in day to day like a mobile phone it has its proper utility to communicate right um so a man who is situated you know with a complete knowledge as where to apply what for the proper utility is the right person right similarly violence also has its utility if we see a judge you know sentencing a murderer can we say that the judge is causing violence unnecessary violence to the other person no it's the rule of the justice right he is following the government so we cannot really say that he is he is unnecessary causing violence um and it is stated you know in in purport it's mentioned that in manu samhita it's clearly mentioned that uh, you know uh, that kings used to give this death sentences to you know a murderer or any sinful act person in fact you know uh, it is mentioned that uh, the person has to be immediately sentenced to death why because that will save that is good for that person itself because that will save that person to commit further sins in that particular life and also that will also save him not to suffer at a higher grade level in the upcoming life right in the next life so it is better to kill such an aggressor that's what we learned before as well you know so so therefore fighting um the fighting to be executed by arjuna is is what krishna is instructing and he fighting with full knowledge of understanding that he is he cannot kill us all nobody can kill us all right but he has to perform his duty because the body is anyways temporary yeah? and there will be no sinful action because they are a resource right they were um they were on the adharma side bhishma and drona so one more comparison i think we did this in our one of our nine sessions um so um harshita will you like to recite this shloka yeah vasham shi jirna jirnani yodha vihaya navani grahanati nanuparani tatha sair tatha sharirani vihaya jirnani ayani samyati navani dehi as a person gives up old garments and new accepts new garments the soul similarly gives up old and useless bodies and attains new bodies as a person puts on new garments giving giving up old ones the soul similarly accepts new material bodies giving up the old and useless ones thank you so yeah so just like so what is body compared to here to garments right to clothes so just like we are very happy when we get new clothes you know uh, we see that devotees of the lord are very happy when they you know uh, are not affected and are happy when they get a new body you know? so we saw how a body without the soul has just no value right and that's why you know with awareness of this thing um we see devotees are less disturbed you know um as they not only hear this but they also digest this concept given by krishna right as they realize you know how, why this life is so important as a human you know and utilize this life in uh, krishna consciousness activity you know? um and krishna assures you know in eighth chapter that at the time of death if you you know remember me you will come back to my you know abode and and he also says you know that yeah that supreme abode where few you know all the vedanta speak about you know which is eternal and will never fall back to this material world again that abode is his 
he says tad dhamam paramam mama that supreme abode is mine right so once we reach that abode there will be we don't have to undergo this life cycle you know birth and um, death cycle life cycle right so that's what he says here that as a person puts on new garments gives up old ones similarly soul gives up the current body and accepts the new ones yeah the useless ones it, it gives up that so we saw this in nine sessions in relation to also an example which is the queen and the cage does anybody remember the story anybody who haven't spoken it was about a queen uh, you know taking care of the cage and the bird within the cage would anyone like to okay so uh, we saw this story where um, there was a singing parrot and it was uh, bought by the queen and it came in a golden cage yeah now when the queen bought the parrot in the cage because the cage was gold golden it that golden cage she was so attracted to the cage of the you know that that cage that that became her pride and glory and you know that it attracted her so much that you know that was her focus all the time and you know constantly when you know she used to have you know people visit her she used to make them see it she was really crazy you know behind that cage because it was so beautiful but she ignored the parrot behind it and we saw how slowly because she was busy only cleaning the cage every day she forgot to feed the parrot and what happened in the end that the parrot died and then like uh, you know uh, a typical human tendency the insane queen blame the god that i polished the cage every day then why did the bird die so the the reality was the speciality of that whole thing was a singing parrot right that was the whole base of that but the attention of the queen was only on the outer body of that parrot which was the cage right so what do we learn here that we are wrong in thinking that we are just the cage right which we are always busy taking care of yeah we should remember that you know we are souls yeah and soul should not be neglected it should be nourished and only when it is nourished you know with uh, devotional practices or by performing different limbs of bhakti it will satisfy the soul right yeah so we we do the same you know if we look at our day routine what do we think how much time do we spend in spiritual activities versus our material and in 24 hours you know maybe um, you know we can analyze this on ourselves that do we how much do we really spend for soul versus to our body in a day you know and it is a good activity to do because it kind of opens our eye right as um, you know really you know i'm spending so much on uh, something which is temporary right it's an eye opener right so there are some characteristics which krishna has mentioned from shloka 23 to 25 that um you know the soul cannot be cut into pieces by weapon nor it can be burned by air nor moistened by water nor withered by the wind it is unbreakable insoluble it cannot be burnt or dried it is everlasting unchangeable immovable and eternally um you know the same so uh, it is invisible inconceivable immutable yeah so we should not grieve for the body so he gives all rationales all the characteristics of the soul um you know and the qualities of the soul in just one right uh, and and here um it is 
and that that makes us you know that uh, remember every time we see this it, it's like it's the one which is permanent yeah. so um with that um we move on to the last couple of shlokas we have so this is again we touch base on this a bit but i'll just go through this shloka so uh, which clearly states that every one of us have to undergo this birth and death cycle it is a mandated you know if thing in this material nature it's a rule so nobody can you know save us from this you know um so the shloka is jatasya hi dhruvo mrityu dhruvam janma mrityasya cha tasmat apihar he arte na tvam sochitam arhasi one who has taken his birth is sure to die and after that one is sure to take birth again therefore in the unavoidable discharge of your duty you should not lack that's what krishna is saying you know? so when krishna is there he is he is just asking arjuna to just go ahead and do your duty because this is going to happen either way you know? and we spoke how this whole thing is krishna's plan right so krishna has yogamaya curtain on arjuna He has put Arjuna in illusion. So, and in le- later in eleventh chapter, we'll see how Krishna expresses that he has, you know, these people on the field are already killed. You know, they are entering into them already. So everything it will happen, right? So, uh, so what Arjuna needs to do is just do your duty, part of your duty. Yeah. So, um, right. Um, so. again krishna highlights here that everything you know it's like a cycle of manifestation and unmanifestation when it comes to birth and death so avyakta didi bhutani vyakta madhyani bharata avyakta nidhinani eva tatra ka paridevana so hari krishna ji will you be able to read it because i know that time you couldn't The all created beings are unmanifested in their beginning, manifested in their incoming state, and unmanifested again when annihilated. So, what need is therefore lamentation. Right. Thank you. So we can just uh, correlate this with you know a big building or a skyscraper. um as an example so a big skyscraper it is manifested as a skyscraper from the elements right from the main elements of this earth from the five elements of earth and when you know this skyscraper is built and when it is after some time it can be dismantled right so it is unmanifested and but the atoms are the same right it's the same elements from which it was manifested and after it is unmanifested you know after the building is dismantled the elements will remain the same right so both at the beginning and the at the end all elements you know they remain the same you know it's just that it takes a manifested form and at some time point it takes the unmanifested form yeah and again it can be manifested so the cycle goes on so we can correlate this with you know what we say you know the energy overall it cannot be created nor destroyed it is just that it is converted okay? so so when you know um, when temporarily things are manifested and unmanifested that means that their nature is temporary so why do we need to even lament on that unmanifest state yeah so we should aim at having not such a temporary body but rather a permanent body and that permanent body is nothing but getting that transcendental body right which can only be obtained when we go back to krishna's abode because we don't have to undergo he said in previous talk that we don't have to undergo that birth and death cycle when we reach his abode yeah because our body is also transcendental and okay. so just moving the last two slides for today then um again you know krishna highlights how amazing this soul is yeah so how 
you know some people interpret it as amazing you know some see the soul as amazing some describe it as amazing some hear it as amazing and even after we hear you know even after hearing some cannot know it we are not able to accept we are the permanent factor right so the astonishing soul though the soul is atomic it exists and spreads throughout the body of gigantic and micro world you will see you know how we saw the size of the soul right it is the tip of one ten thousands of uh, part of the tip of the hair right and that's why we see as big as an elephant or as small as an micro right it exists and the consciousness is spread right so yet it is untouched by the bodily changes yeah it is not touched right it doesn't undergo any changes with many such contradictory qualities the soul is truly astonishing yeah so even though it is the most smallest tiniest part it is the one which is permanent and that tiny should be our focus yeah because only nourishing that will help us in a long longer yeah? for us to reach gratification yes so the final conclusion which krishna gives here is o descendant of bharata he who dwells in the body can never be slain therefore you need not grieve for any living thing yeah so krishna overall presented the analytical study right of body and soul that gnana uh, it's all yeah sankhya yoga that is also sankhya philosophy so um arjuna's compassion overall towards the body was completely rejected by krishna right and krishna put forth so many different doctrines in front of him and he explained arjuna that it is natural cycle yeah nobody can stop it either way and he should rather focus on performing his duty now this you know i would just like to conclude by saying that this knowledge is very important for us like i said before because it kind of brings us a detachment within ourselves that attachment to the body it reduces you know? and it gives us a sense of our you know this chapter is also called as you know it unrevealing the true identity of ours so it awakens our true identity to the real reality you know? and the temporariness of this world so it does benefit us you know this knowledge because it helps to have different dimensions to the way we look at things right Uh, to also develop a let go attitude right which which where we accept that this is natural this is going to happen the level of acceptance increases and we start having more deeper approach you know um and it adds meaning to overall approach with that said um yes just will conclude that all we learned you know mainly was the soul and the body and body is destructible it changes as growth and you know it's just like a vehicle for us to take to our final destination you know um which is krishna yeah so with that i close this session for today